What's going on guys and welcome back to another Geeky Gecko Creations video. In this video we're going to be setting up about 50 or 60 baby leopard geckos, black knights, bold stripes, tangerines, all kinds of high end stuff right now. All right, starting it off strong, we got a couple Black Knight babies here. These were Black Knights cross to Tangerine Tornado, cross back to Black Knight. So they will be in the like Black Knight Lava Project, basically meaning the Tangerine Black Knight Project. Here's a little up close of the one baby. This one has more tangerine on it, I can tell. Might be hard for you to tell from home, but it's much easier to see in person. And just to kind of show you what the tub looks like that we set up all of our babies in. So we put about 30, 40 worms, some on, half on the floor, half in the bowl, 0.5 ounce water dish, 1.5 ounce water dish. You don't want to fill it up all the way because as the tub gets moved around, it'll spill and then it might be too wet in there. Moisture causes bacteria. And then I put the the human hide right here in front of the food and water so as the baby's walking around they're almost forced to have to go over the food and over the water here's a couple nice mandarin inferno tremper line stuff so this one as you can see is tremper albino this one is het tremper albino so the visual tremper you could see clearly an albino and then the non-visual clearly not an albino since albinism requires lack of black pigment and that one has a ton of black pigment now, black pigment in babies winds up turning purple as the gecko is around 15 to 30 days old. And then around 30 days to like 90 days plus, that pigment turns green. And then probably around like four to five months plus, the green starts fading away little by little into the color of the animal's skin tone, which in this case is orange since it's a tangerine. And we have our video coming out soon on leopard gecko color development and how to predict the colors of leopard gecko change, where the colors on the body of leopard geckos changes take place and what to expect during those changes and how to know if you have an above average colored leopard gecko or not. So very much looking forward to that video because I think a lot of new people to leopard geckos are very caught off guard by the dramatic changes that they go through and it's just good for them to be aware. This is a Mandarin Inferno Giant Blood Emerine. So three different lines of tangerine, the giant gene or line, whatever you want to call it. We'll talk about that in a second. And then emerine, which basically stands for green coloration, just like what I was talking about in the last segment. Now, the reason why the giant gene is so controversial is because there's a lot of debate in the hobby, whether it is one of three different types of mutations. Mutation number one, originally when it came out, it was thought completely to be incomplete dominant. I believe that was in Ron Tremper's first book. I have not read his his first book but when I was first getting into leopard geckos eight years ago or so like on a deeper research level I think that information was just everywhere that giant was an incomplete dominant gene which is why two copies of the gene are called super giant and that's why the name super giant even exists you can't have a super anything unless you could have a single copy incomplete dominant mutation. And so for the longest time, people claimed it was incomplete dominant. One copy makes a giant, two copies makes a super giant, an even larger gecko. But Ron Tremper did retire at some point around, I think like 2010 or 2014 or something like that. Left the company, which is still running and functioning in the good hands of one of his friends. And he still kind of functions in an advisory supportive role to my knowledge. And so after Ron left, most people tended to believe that giants are line bred to be big. Similar to tangerine and similar to black knight, how you can breed for darker animals over time or breed for more orange animals over time, they were claimed to be line bred morphs. And I would say most people in the hobby, kind of including myself right now at this point until it's proven otherwise, tend to believe it's a line bred thing, meaning that when you breed big animals to big animals, you're just gonna have higher odds of making big Bigger animals. The reason I show this animal to you and I'm even talking about it, I was going to skip over this one, is because this animal is actually a little on the smaller side. The last four geckos that I showed were bigger than this little one 
and Black Knights are actually a small bloodline, and the Black Knights were at least 10, 15% bigger than this little guy is, and then the Tangerine ones from the last slide were also bigger by about 10, 15%, and so it, it's a good opportunity to talk about the controversy over Giant. And then recently, within the last few years, I think it was 2020 or so, Ron dropped his second or third book, I believe it was, claiming that the Super Giant was recessive. Now, I hate when people take something that I say out of context and spin it in a different way that isn't true, so I've never read that from Ron's book, but comment below if you've read that from Ron's book. I've heard it from multiple sources, and there was a little bit of drama going around the hobby when he first announced that because people were like, what? There's, there's no way it's recessive. And there are some people that focus on the giant gene. I think the number one breeder that comes to mind is Calico Geckos. I remember I had a conversation with him when we purchased a bunch of Black Knights from him originally when I was first like getting started and we were talking about the giant stuff. And I believe from our conversation, I remember him saying that he is convinced that they are incomplete dominant. He's also convinced based on my conversation with him at that time that they need to be grown up to the point of two years old before they are bred and before they are full grown. So whereas a normal leopard gecko is full grown at about like eight months to a year and a half old before they max out at like their full fat to muscle to bone density ratio and all of that. Super giants take a little longer pushing two to 2.5 years to reach that same hurdle. Now the reason that I think it's more line bred is because I have bred a lot of giants and super giants by now, and there does not seem to be any consistency with it, at least for me. And I'm probably nowhere on the scale as Calico Geckos, so I don't want to ignore his data and research, but I do think there needs to be data and research presented because otherwise everything is just word of mouth. But from my word of mouth and many others in the hobby, many people realize that breeding two super giants together can produce small animals, or breeding two non-super giants or non-giants together can produce big animals. So at the end of the day, it seems to be more like human eye color, hair color, skin color, where there are multiple genes involved. This is called polygenetics, when multiple genes combine together to create a desired effect, such as size of the gecko, blackness of the gecko, orangeness of the gecko, bold stripes of the gecko. These are all examples of what we call line bred traits, where you breed them out for many generations generations to other animals that are either directly related to animals that have those traits or animals that are not related but also display those traits. Now the breakdown of the actual definition of those words we can go a little deeper but that's pretty much how people use it in the hobby so we're just going to simplify it and leave it at that. But with that I will end my super giant rant and we will move on to the next geckos. All right you guys are in for a treat because we got five cheetah leopard geckos here. And cheetah is becoming a pretty popular project where a lot of people are asking about it because they saw the spawn leopard gecko on my Instagram page and also on our YouTube channel. I made a video about it. I'll link that here. It's truly one of the most outstanding head patterns and neck patterns on a leopard gecko that I've ever seen, if not the most outstanding pattern. And you can kind of see from this cheetah project, I have multiple geckos this year that have similar stuff to that, like this, where you could see the neck band bleeds into the top of the head, which will give the animal a higher chance to produce spawn-like features or that diamond arrowhead shaped features. And you can see it has like these two polka dots on the top. I have a ton of those that have the two polka dots, which look like owl eyes. And so I'm holding back all of the ones that have two dots that look like owls and I'm calling it the owl project. So, so many different cool projects projects that I'm working on over here. And that's one of the benefits to leopard geckos is because they are polygenetic animals, meaning that they always produce something different no matter what, and they have a high likelihood and propensity to do that. There is literally infinite amount of possibilities when it comes to projects with leopard geckos. You could breed animals for different colors, such as yellow, such as orange, such as yellow orange, such as black, such as lavender, or you could breed animals for 
or pattern, such as the spawn leopard gecko, which has an arrowhead shape on its head, the bold stripe leopard gecko, which has stripes down its sides, the red diamond leopard gecko, which has tangerine, tremper albino, and very cool, like wonky jungle pattern, the clown and joker project, which focuses on non albino animals that have very high levels of emerine and tangerine combination, along with a lot of polka dots with a jungle pattern on the animal, all the way down to our infinity project, which you might have seen me mention where, you know, we have a few leopard geckos that have like a figure eight on their head or close to a figure eight. So I have an infinity project going to try to get animals consistently that have a figure eight on their head. I have the tiger project for lavender banded tangerines with heavy black spots in the bands. The cheetah project for just heavily, heavily spotted and pixelated animals that for whatever reason seem to be coming with some very interesting head patterns leading to the spawn project, the owl project, you know, there's offshoot projects that come out of these things. And so when talking about leopard geckos, it's kind of like a blank canvas and you're the artist and their genetics are the paint or the pencils that you're gonna be coloring and drawing with. And if you can imagine it, and if you wait long enough and try hard enough, almost anything is possible. Now, there are certain things that are highly unlikely because certain pigmentation and stuff just does not seem to exist in leopard geckos and that would be like the blue pigmentation, right? Except for super snows and snows on top of their eyes have blue, but that could just be from the shadowing of the eye that is underneath the more translucent skin because they are snows and their skin is more translucent above the eye, especially with like fasciolatus leopard geckos, which I'll leave that video here in the top right corner too so you can learn about the translucentness of fasciolatus and why we have the Mr. Freeze project and the significance of that to create higher white, more lavender geckos lasting into adulthood. But it's the same with like human beings, right? Our genetic code, which is called the genome of an animal or a human, does not currently possess the ability to produce a true blue skin pigment coloration. Now, if someone can't breathe, their face starts to go blue. I think that's mainly just because the blood is like clotting up in that area, right? But that is not the same as the color of your skin. I am not a human skin color expert, but it seems like the color pigmentation possible in humans would range anywhere from black, like pure black, which would be like a mole. A mole is pure black to shades of dark brown, medium brown, light brown. Then you start hitting dark tan, medium tan, light tan. Then you start hitting shades of like darkish white, like creamy white to medium creamy white to like ultra creamy white. And so in the same way, every animal in the animal kingdom, including leopard geckos, have what's called a genome. And the genome contains what is actually possible for that animal or not. And this is why I don't think the case for evolution is very strong is because we see a limitation to genetic code. For example, a human being cannot just begin to form the genetic code for wings just because he jumps off of his house every single day. His genetic code is not going to start being like, you know what, this guy's jumping a lot. We should form wings. Otherwise, the monkeys swinging from the trees would have formed wings hundreds of thousands of years ago, as Darwin evolutionists claim how things evolved through species. But if you think about this for a second, if this leopard gecko had to turn into a human being, the genetic code to turn into a human being, even if it's slowly but surely to grow fingernails, a human brain, human lungs, and all that stuff. To my understanding, Darwin towards the end of his life understood that his theory was not sound. It was not solid, but obviously athe atheists and people who are not religious and don't believe in the potential for a creator, they took his theories and ran with it and came up with their own justifications. But basically they say with enough time, anything is possible, but that's not true. At least I don't believe. My human cognition and intuition tells me that no matter how many times a leopard gecko tries, it's never going to start to form human features because it's not programmed into the leopard gecko's DNA. So that whole question of what came first, the chicken or the egg, my hypothesis would be the chicken, meaning that creation started it all because you have to start with 
genetic code to even evolve or adapt. Adaptation is clearly visible in today's world. We see birds that change their beak size. We see birds that change their color. We see reptiles that get longer toes or shorter snouts based on the environment they're living in. But we don't see birds turning back into dinosaurs and we don't see lizards turning into humans. Like we don't even see the beginning of an inkling of a suggestion that that is happening. So I am just trying to reason from a logical perspective that evolution Evolution does not make sense because the genome of an animal, the genetic code that belongs to each animal is unique and different and it never creates another animal. A monkey never turns into a human. A human never turns into a monkey. A fish never turns into a whale. A whale never turns into a salamander. The genetic code is just not there. And so let me dial it down one more time. We were talking about humans developing wings, right? Or even chimps and monkeys monkeys, let's say, because they are much more in the air, much more than humans are, right? Well, now with airplanes and stuff, humans are truly in the air more. If evolution was possible, species that spend a lot of time in the air would have developed wings, but they can't because wings are not in the genetic code of a leopard gecko. Wings are not in the genetic code or even close to the genetic possibility for a human or an ape. So what is within the leopard gecko genetic code as far as color goes? Well, Leopard geckos have chromatophores. And again, I'm not a biology major, so if I say this incorrectly, then you guys who are biology majors, you can correct me. But I believe humans have chromatophores too. And within the chromatophore family are what's called melanophores, which produce black pigment. And so obviously within black pigment, you can have varying shades of black, right? Dark brown, light brown, black. Then there's xanthophores, which sometimes xanthophores has a, a dual meaning of yellow and orange pigment. And then I forget the type of chromatophore or skin coloration cell that is dedicated solely to red coloration, but there's one for red specifically, even though sometimes xanthophores are thrown into the orange, red, and yellow category. Sometimes they're just the yellow category, depending on the species, because take tegus, for example. Tegus can be aneutheristic, which means that they cannot produce red pigment specifically but then in ball pythons, there is no word for an animal that can't be aneutheristic because we don't have the color red in ball pythons, except I do have a red spot on one of my ball pythons, which is really unique, which I'll have to show off and talk about one day. But anyway, you normally never see the color red on ball pythons. So for that reason, we don't really use the word anery. And so by saying that an animal is azanthic in the ball python world, it basically means that it's lacking all color. It's lacking orange, it's lacking it's lacking yellow, it's lacking red. So sometimes those terms can be interchangeable, but usually there is a term for every specific color, right? So melanophores is black. Let's just say for simplicity's sake right now, xanthophores is red, yellow, and orange. Iridiophores are actually white reflective cells, which is where the tumor-like formations can happen within the lemon frost leopard gecko is because of an overproduction of iridiophores that unfortunately cannot die off like a normal cell should die, so they just stack and stack and stack within an animal, which is why lemon frost will sometimes develop those white spots. They just have a higher boost of iridiophores, and then also the iridiophores in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, the iridiophores can't die, which will cause tumors to build up on the animal. We have a video on that too, so I'll link that here in the top right corner. But there is no pigmentation in leopard geckos, at least skin cell-wise, chromatophore-wise, for blue. And I think that's actually all the chromatophores that life has. I'd have to do a little bit of a deeper dive, but like chameleons and stuff that are showing the blue color and like the neon colors, I think what's actually happening is their iridiophores are reflecting and catching certain spectrums of light, you know, that come from the sun or artificially from UVB bulbs and stuff like that. And it's able to catch that light and then reflect it out in its skin tones. I'd have to research that a little bit deeper because in my chromatophore research, I, I never came across a word for a blue pigment cell. But that's what I mean by some things are just not possible. Now, is it possible for a blue mutation cell to mutate and become something that could be possible for leopard geckos? Sure, but as of right now, it's not written in the leopard geckos genome. And if we're going back to my earlier conversation about how leopard geckos just aren't gonna grow wings, there's really no inclination that a blue pigment cell would ever 
randomly pop up in a leopard gecko. And that's just a small change of color, right? And so we can kind of separate the category between like the possibility of a leopard gecko growing wings is far less likely than the possibility of a blue color cell mutation. But I'd have to talk to like a genetic expert or a doctor to see. Maybe there's absolutely no chance that a leopard gecko would ever have either one. But referring to the blue color specifically, when it comes to color with reptiles and lizards, we've seen that a lot of things are possible. But I'm just using that analogy that it's highly, highly unlikely. All right, so here's three pretty cool leopard geckos. Wow, this guy was born with a crooked neck. Look at that. I've actually never, I've probably hatched now, you know, around 3,000 leopard geckos career-wise, and I've never hatched one with an actual crooked neck like that. He looks like the hunchback of Notre Dame. So we'll see if this winds up being something that he can live with, which he seems to be doing good right now. And if it is, then we will pet him out. But this is from our Fasciolatus Turkmenicus Max Snow Eclipse project. So basically the Mr. Freeze plus Turkmenicus plus Eclipse, which Mr. Freeze and Eclipse goes really well together. You can see this baby is definitely an Eclipse. It just has that look to it. Sometimes Eclipse babies are hard to tell in the beginning and sometimes they're easy. You know, you could look for the white nose, you could look for the pigmentation color in the eyes, but sometimes the their eyes are so small it's hard to tell the pigmentation color. But also that more like reverse stripe type pattern and stuff, that's very like reminiscent of Eclipse animals or het eclipse animals. Speaking of eclipse, here's a baby tangerine raptor. And so I can tell because raptors are oftentimes, especially when in tangerine genetics, they're very hypoed out, like super hypo. Uh, plus the coloration is very like bubblegummy, very like bright. And then if you were to look at its eyes, I can actually see red snake eyes. And then this beautiful baby is from our fire project. And you probably can't see the orange color coming through, but it is like five times more orange in person. And so the fire project is our most orange tangerine project and usually it has and revolves around tremper albinos that are just really really like orangey red But this one's obviously not an albino and so that's still okay I'm still calling it fire for now. I might separate that name in the future But for now the fire line or fire project animals are the animals for us that are the most like reddish orange coloration in addition to the red dragon the Red Dragon Project is mainly a super hypo red orange gecko versus the Fire Project does not need to be hypo or super hypo. Therefore, we have some fire girls that are not albino, but so they're like a reddish orange color, but then they also have like a lot of green and like sometimes spotting and jungle pattern. So the ones that are more hypo or super hypo, I leave those as Red Dragon line, which will be very similar to like Tangerine Tornado. How in the Tangerine Tornadoes, you get mostly, at least from what I've seen in my collection, as well as what I've seen other people with the Tangerine Tornado line do, is it's mainly a super hypo, high-end tangerine line. So we got our Red Dragon over here, which is super hypo, reddish orange. Then we got our Fire, which can be hypo or super hypo, reddish orange, but most of the time there's some pattern there and it's Tremper Albino and reddish orange. So that's another two projects we are working heavily on over here. And I've been talking Talking to a lot of camera, videographer, and photographer experts, doing a lot of research, and the color orange is just almost impossible, if not impossible, unless you get really lucky to catch on video or on natural photo. Otherwise, you have to what's called doctor the photo, which means you need to go into an editing software and you need to color correct the photo so that the color of the animal matches more closely to what it looks like in real life, which is why reptile shows are so cool is because you can show off what the animal looks like in real life. But most of the time that takes like either really high knowledge of how photography works because you're talking about color grading and taking raw photos and then doctoring them up and color grading them up. That That's like a special technique or it also takes expensive gear, fairly expensive gear, you know, or both. So most people, what they do is they just slide the saturation slider or the color sliders in their phone editing software for the photograph 
photograph, but then that changes everything. That changes your hand color, the background color. And so when that happens, it really doesn't give you the best overall look and the photo looks very manipulated. And you don't want a manipulated looking photo when you are selling animals. Oh wow, this other one also comes from a fire tangerine, which is red, orange, tremper albino, bred to a bold. So it's a fire bold, not the actual fire bold, but like it's a fire plus bold. And then of course it's a raptor. So it's visual eclipse, visual tremper albino. So this one for a raptor, this one might evolve to have a lot of orange coloration since our fire line does have a lot of orange coloration. So we might wind up keeping this one. So we'll see. I, I, I've actually been holding back a ton of really nice tangerine eclipse, tangerine raptor type stuff because I really want to create like a world renowned tangerine raptor like project and line of ours because you know tangerine is a tough color to get into eclipse but we've hatched a lot of eclipses around here and raptors that have very very nice color orange and so that's why I want to capitalize on that hold them all back and whenever you do that the more you can produce the more numbers you can produce the more likely you are to hit the odds you're looking for as far as getting like super high quality and unique animals all right here's a couple super giant bloods that are het radar so het eclipse het bell albino and these come from the norman davis legacy line as well as the new collection which you've probably been hearing me talk about we took in 180 leopard geckos from a good friend of ours out here in, in, in arizona very high-end stuff ciphers top end tangerine bells fire bolts all kinds of stuff black knights so we got 100 new 80 high-end geckos we infused from him plus norman davis's 150 high-end geckos plus our whatever it was at that time 300 400 plus like high-end breeders and stuff so we have basically three high-end collections mixed in one now and it's fantastic I'm really looking forward to mixing and matching all of these different projects and bloodlines now I have pretty much like almost every line I could think of red diamond tangerine tornado tango crush Mandarin inferno bell giant super giant and again these babies right here are maybe, for, for being super giant babies, they're just about the same size as all the other babies that you've been seeing, maybe slightly, slightly bigger. So that's why I wanted to pull them out and talk about the super giant radar lines that we are working with. But the reason I like to tell people about the controversy of super giant is so that they're not disappointed because it's the same that I try to do with anything when I'm educating is I'd rather people know the truth and then they can make a decision for themselves of how much they want to pay for an animal or what something is worth or what projects to work but they won't be able to make those decisions and have as great of a time if they don't know the full truth and everything that's out there on certain lines and projects what I've noticed with super giant more or less is they actually don't seem to be longer than regular leopard geckos because regular let's just take males for example a regular male leopard gecko will usually be around 10 to 11 inches and maybe around 80 to 90 grams just thinking loosely off the top of my head I don't know I haven't really like weighed every male that I have but I think just thinking loosely off the top of my head that seems to be about right and then super giants you know a lot of people back in the day and sometimes still even till today they will say things like oh to be a super giant it has to be over 110 grams or something like that and that's a in my opinion that's a terrible metric of measurement because then what happens is what happens if a leopard gecko just has a chunky tail. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but some leopard geckos actually have longer tails than other leopard geckos, and some leopard geckos actually have naturally thicker tails than other leopard geckos. Also, some leopard geckos have naturally bigger bone structure, just like human beings, right? Like Jack Black is not the same as Justin Bieber, right? Jack Black is 250 pounds and like five foot seven, five foot eight. Justin Bieber's what? Maybe like 150 on a good day and he's like six foot so when you take that and put it into leopard gecko terms it's exactly the same and that's what I think is going on with the super giants most of the super giants that I see they look like they have maybe slightly bigger bone structure but in some cases they look like they have the exact same bone structure just a higher fat ratio right but then there's also muscle density that you could bring into the equation for example some people are born naturally skinny with low muscle 
muscle density. Other people are born naturally bulky with like wide musculature and, and density. And sometimes that has to do with skeletal frame as well. Like I have very wide shoulders. My shoulders are very wide, but you know, there are some people that have very narrow shoulders. The shoulder to shoulder ratio will be very low. And so of course I'm going to weigh more than somebody who's the exact same size as me, but maybe they have a more narrow shoulder base and a more lean muscle density or fat density in this case, since I have put on a lot of fat, but you, I think you kind of get the idea what I'm talking about is humans come in all different kinds of colors, shapes, and sizes. So why would we expect that leopard gecko genetics would not be the same? And so that's what I think is going on more or less with giant and super giant leopard geckos is I think there's just a bunch of different genetic information that are mixing. And sometimes you, you get a super giant that's 110 grams, that's 10 inches long, but has a very high fat density. And sometimes you get a super giant that's 120 grams, but maybe 12 inches long and has a leaner fat density, but a higher muscle density and a thicker bone density. And so the weight metric to calculate a giant or super giant is totally biffed in my opinion. And when you consider the fact that a normal male leopard gecko can be up to 11 inches and can be up to 90-ish plus grams, you don't really find super giants that are much bigger than that in actuality. You know, super giants are not like 15 inches, right? If an if a super giant was 15 inches, hands down, I would think something genetic is going on for sure, because that is a big difference from a naturally 10 to 11 inch animal to a 15 inch animal. That's like one third more the growth size. That's a 30% growth size. But when you're talking about an animal that is only 10% larger than the average animal and it's not consistent to reproduce that even from super giant to super giant pairings i just think that there's something coming up short there with our understanding of super giant and we'll see with genetic testing one day we should be able to know for sure but for now me and many other people in the hobby just tend to believe that it is a line bred polygenetic type scenario here's one of our new black knight projects so this is dbbns so this was afghanicus Turkmenicus, which has dark genetics, very dark, very heavily spotted boy, bred to our pure black knight stuff. And then those babies, which were first generation, bred back to black knight. And that's what these guys are. So now these guys are second generation of that. And so they're part of like, I haven't decided if I'm gonna name this something differently yet because these guys technically have 12.5% Turkmenicus DNA in there, 12.5% Afghanicus DNA in there, and 75% just normal black knight DNA in there, but our obsidian line is our Afghanicus black knight project, and this is our Afghanicus Turkmenicus black knight project. Now Turkmenicus should bring in more size, and Afghanicus should bring in more darkness, and so that's kind of the goal with those two projects. And mostly all black knights that are just like regular black knight gene or genetics, so to speak, they're gonna hatch out with like some pattern showing, but then as time goes on, time will determine just how much of that pattern gets covered up. And sometimes it's 100%, which is maybe like, I don't know, one out of 10 times if you're working with like really high density black knight to black knight pairings. Other times it might be one out of 20 or whatever the case is. But regardless, that's why I came up with my black knight grading system, which I'll link that video in the top right corner so that you can grade S tier black knights, which are like perfect or close to perfect, A tier, which are very nice, B tier, which are decent, and C and D tier, which are like almost non-expressive, but they come from Black Knight genetics, which does happen sometimes. So that's why I don't like to sell Black Knights too early. Although next year we probably will because, you know, Lord willing, we should have a lot. So the risk that I take of selling a gecko that I would want to keep goes down. But that's why I normally like to grow them up is so that I can see how each animal is going to turn out, what sex they're going to be, because they do take a little bit longer to sex than a normal leopard gecko because their body frame is condensed a little bit and their private parts can be very misleading early on in life and so usually for black knights I don't like to guarantee sex until like five plus months because sometimes you'll have an animal that looks male and it's just a female with a condensed like anus area and big hemipenes and it's a female other times it may not be showing anything because it's a late bloomer male and it doesn't show until five months plus that it's actually a male and so I will tell people when they buy animals from me what it looks like but I will usually 
usually give them the rundown that it's hard to give you a 100% guarantee because of late blooming males and because of females that have big bulges early on. And that identification system gets more difficult with black knights because of their shorter body frame. So that's why the Turkmenikis DNA in the Afghanikis Turkmenikis black knight line I just showed you should have bigger black knight genetics. And then we're also holding back all the black knights that are just like bigger in general. And we have a lot of outcrosses from years prior that are very big. So I'm hopeful that we will be able to produce big black knights. All right, guys, this is actually going to be the last one that I show on camera because it's getting late and filming is slowing me down a little bit and I need to finish all of these babies tonight. But these are from our Black Knight Max Snow project. So you can see this one is a Black Knight Max Snow. It's all white. And then this one right here is just Black Knight No Max Snow. Kind of watch those two guys for a sec while I set up their cages over here. Oh wow, it couldn't work more perfect than this. I have two tubs, two humid hides, for two geckos and maybe, oh, and these humid hides are baby hides. Amazing how things work out sometimes. And they're not dirty. I don't have to clean them prior. Even more amazing. And they came from Black Knight Leopard Geckos. That's so funny. Sometimes it's just amazing how things work out, right? So I haven't decided yet, but maybe I'll make these guys my last two of the night and then I'll put the rest away tomorrow just because it is getting late. I'm screaming right here. And yeah, I don't know what else to say about these guys other than they are in our Black Knight Max Snow project. Ultimately, this project is leading towards the Panda project. So I have a ton of Black Knight Max Snows that are very high quality and we'll continue to be breeding those to other Black Knight Max Snows to create Super Snow Black Knights that are high quality as well as incorporating the Eclipse gene in there to create true pandas. But in actuality, I might like just the normal Super Snow Black Knight better because because it has more black pigment that is covering the body. And the Eclipse one, which is the true panda, removes a lot of that pigment, but it's still cool. I, I think that's actually really fun in its own self. So that is gonna be it for tonight, guys. I'm gonna stop the filming there. I still have a bunch of more babies to set up. So maybe if I do it tomorrow, I might do another film of it, or maybe I'll break this video down into a couple segments. But regardless, I thank you guys for being here. Let me know what you thought of the video. Let me know what you thought of the projects, some of the discussions we had in a comment below. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Recommend what you would like to see below. As you see, we're dropping more content now, ball pythons, sailfins, tegus, leopard geckos, but you know leopard geckos are dear to my heart. So we're definitely gonna pump back out the most leopard gecko content that we can. We're also doing a lot of live streams and stuff now, so feel free to tune into those. And until next time, my friends, stay safe, pursue your reptile passion, and have a geeky gecko great day. Peace. Oh, hello, I didn't see you there. I was just walking my gecko when I wanted to tell you about Geeky Gecko Creations. We understand here at Geeky Gecko Creations that buying a gecko for the modern American is the most important decision they'll ever make. That's why the owner Frank offers you this guarantee, that your gecko will be purchasable online, will ship on a dime, and will arrive and thrive for its new Geeky Gecko lifetime. But you can't have this gecko, this one is mine. Say goodbye to the days of regular run-of-the-mill pet store geckos who may or may not hate the things you hold dear. What do you mean you hate 18th century English architecture? Here at GGC, our reptiles are handled regularly to help them acclimate to humans, and for even more knowledge before adoption, Frank can make you a personalized video of your chosen pet or pets and detail their temperament before you make the final decision. Then it's just a quick online order to ship your new reptile best friend right to your door, safe and sound, nearly year-round. There's even more options than just geckos, too. But that's not a part of this commercial, and I'm running out of ad space. So be sure to check out the Geeky Gecko Creations YouTube channel and website on the regular to see the new morphs the boys in the lab are cooking up. All right, Frank, I'm looking for the gecko. I don't- Whoa! Oh, God! Ha! Ah, just, it's, it's fantastic! It's, it's, oh, it's big! It's bigger than a- Okay, Frank! Frank, it's not my life! Frank! Geeky Gecko Creations, bringing you the geckos of the future today.